Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for your blessings uh, today as we continue to learn about the blessing of the Lord's Prayer. We ask that you guide our discussion and the meditations of our hearts. They may be encouraging, uplifting, and faithful to you. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Okay, did everybody get a handout? So I think there's one more up here. All right. I did a better job estimating than I normally do. There are like seven extras. Okay. All right. So if you've got a Bible, open up your Bible to Job chapter 10. So if you recall, unlike me, who forgot last week, we're supposed to read chapters 11 through 20 in the book of Job. And as, as per our agreement from a few weeks ago, we're just going to go through a couple of questions. We're not going to do a big in-depth look at it because the Bible class isn't really about Job. Although, if you want to have one about Job, we can do that later. Um, and so, here we go. So, to begin, um, if you remember from chapter 1 in the book of Job, it says that Job is blameless. What does that mean? It does think? not mean faultless. It does not mean faultless. Okay. What does blameless mean? They said the same thing is said of uh, Noah as well. That Noah was blameless. In favor with the Lord. In favor with the Lord, not quite, although close. The Hebrew word for this is Tom, T A M, is our transliteration of it, and it means to be complete. And this meant integrity. That this person was in, it was a person that possessed integrity. So. Essentially, Job didn't owe God anything. He was a properly confessing sinful person. Right? Um, so the blameless doesn't mean sinless. And I think that's especially important in the context of Job, because if you think Job is sinless, then everything that happens to him is completely unjustified. But if we understand that Job, like us, is a fallen human being suffering from the condition of original sin, that means that God is totally justified in doing the things that he's doing. Because Job doesn't deserve any of the blessings that he's gotten from God. Right? We, we learned when we were talking about the daily bread, right, that that comes not from our, our deserving of those provisions, but from God's mercy. Right? When we talk about God's mercy, that's undeserved things. Those are things he gives us that we don't deserve it, right? So really, you could start to think of what happens to Job as a slight glimpse of what we actually deserve under the law. We deserve all of our blessings taken, taken away up and to. Right? When we confess this, when we do our confession in church, right, we say that I believe that I deserve your temporal and eternal, eternal punishment, right? That apart from Christ, that's what I deserve. I deserve to have all of my temporal blessings taken away in my temporal life and even my eternal life. But then we appeal to God's mercy, right? Particularly his mercy in Jesus. So in chapter one, when it talks about Job being blameless, it's not referring to him being sinless. Okay, he is someone who's got integrity. He's an honorable name. Yeah. So I, I still struggle with that maybe part of the theology when we talk about like deserving, I mean, um, you know, the way he's portrayed, right? It's he's not brought about this kind of suffering on anybody else, right? That, that he's less other people, and I mean, okay, theologically we have the fall, we know we have our fallen nature, and I maybe I can understand when we say, well, we don't we don't deserve any of the blessings. But when there's just utter calamity, um, I don't know. I guess I just I, I struggle with the, the, the theology of that. How how do we really say he's deserving of essentially punishment? I mean, it's because right, because it's more than taking away blessings, isn't it? It's yeah. that he's you know, yeah. he's receiving punishment that really wasn't. Do you know that you're deserving of that punishment? I'm deserving of that punishment. Job is deserving. But it doesn't, it, it doesn't seem proportionate at all, right? I mean, it, that, that's what I struggle with. I mean, 
You sound like Joe. <laughs> Actually, you're starting to sound a little bit more like some of his friends. Yeah, true. <laughs> because what his friends are trying to do, and we'll get into some of the questions, is they want to explain away the, 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 the struggle, the tension of why is God causing this suffering? Right? And we're going to look at some of their explanations. But like this is... This is what Job teaches you. Is it teaches you to sit in that struggle for a moment and realize, like, what you're struggling with is the reality of your fate in the face of God without Christ. Right? Because the the message of Job isn't isn't suffering in grace. It isn't uh, explaining the suffering away, but it's acknowledging the total sovereignty of God. And so, like. When you talk about the weight of sin, right? So we were, we were talking about degrees a moment ago, right? That it seems disproportionate, the, the punishment seems disproportionate to the crime, right? Uh, in, in terms of like the cosmic consequences of our fall into sin, like the Christian faith teaches that our total eternal destruction is not outside of the bounds of justice according to the law. In fact, it's really what's demanded, right? Otherwise, there's no reason to send Christ. The only problem is temporal death. The only problem is suffering in this life. Um, and so, and this is what Job really forces you to sit with and wrestle with. And it's and in, in affluent Western culture, we've, we've taken for granted the degree to which the mercy of the gospel has become inundated in our basic way of thinking because we're in the third or fourth generation of a country founded on those sort of, based on those principles and ideas. And so it's easy in that context to get suckered in thinking, well, people are basically good. But the Bible teaches that people are basically bad or basically sinful, right? That's what original sin teaches. And so Job is really the, the part of the Job is that you're wrestling with the reality of who you are in the presence of God, which is You've made yourself his enemy. And so under the law, apart from Christ, that's a horrible place to be. Okay? And so like the example in uh, the gospel reading today, what was Peter's reaction when he saw the glory of God in Jesus? And Isaiah's reaction as well, is they immediately became acutely aware of the fact that they were unworthy to even be in the presence of God. And their, their fear was not a respect fear. It was... I'm in the midst of an absolute being. I'm in the presence of an absolute being that has the authority and the complete justified action to wiping me from existence. Right? And so it's a real fear of the Lord. Right? So, and I think we've kind of done ourselves a disservice in Western Christianity. We have all these depictions of God are the soft side of God. Right? So we got pictures of Jesus bland and children, and he always has like a really kind look on his face and stuff like that. But that same Jesus is the one who's coming back to be the judge of all life, right? For both the judge of, like, you're declared innocent because of the gospel, and you're declared guilty and sentenced to eternal damnation. I, I guess the way I look at it is we don't deserve anything. I mean, our baseline is down here, yeah. which is basically where God brought it. Right. But it wasn't out of retaliation. It wasn't out of um, punishment. It was because that was God's will. And he had a plan, and, and Job was part of that, right? So, sure. But I mean, this is still a is still a punishment. I mean, if original sin is true, it's still a punishment for sin. I mean, I, yeah, it's the way. Maybe it's just the phrasing. I just really struggle with that because he's not. I mean, even in here, I mean, I mean, God's not saying. I mean, his friends are saying he's punished that it, that he must have done something wrong. And that's sort of what you're saying. They're, well, no, that's not what I'm saying. It's an opposite. I'm saying, I mean, they said it at the very beginning, which is blameless. Right. And so the whole point is, this is God's plan. We don't have uh, the right to challenge what his plan is. We don't have the right to potter to, to the, uh, the, the, the clay can't say to the potter, you know, I, I don't want to be like that. I mean, sure. Or so maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're saying. Because what you, what I'm hearing kind of sounds how, like it. So. How can we call that? punishment as opposed to just saying well god withdrew his blessings it's just that maybe it's the phrasing it's just i don't know it's, it's well, I was, I was, oh sorry i was never here in my kind of actually read this was looking for that phrasing of deserving is that something that's that here in the bible to show 
Well, so what the so Job is is not like so we're not saying specifically when I talk about deserving, I'm talking about the base level of the relationship between all humans, most of all, and God. And Job is included. So if you're talking about this being a punishment on Job for some specific thing, it's that's not true. But when we're confessing our sin, we're not just confessing the sin of our activity, our act of sinning. We're confessing that by nature, we are sinful and unclean. Right? That, so the, the probably the best way to think of original sin is that it's an incurable terminal disease. You didn't choose to get it. You were born into it because of the fall into sin. And because of that, you are an enemy of God. And so in that sense, any sort of just application of the law in your life is a punishment of that sin. Not a punishment of like you did this particular thing last Thursday, and so now God is going to smite you. Okay. And essentially what Jesus, what God is trying to prove here with, with uh, Job is that my blessings are not the reason he believes him. Right? Right, that's what I thought. Yeah, and it's doing that by illustrating that part of the reality of, of the faith of Job, because it's not in the blessings of God, it is in God being God. And part of what that means is that you are at 100% total mercy of his action. Right? Now, of course, the book doesn't end with Job's death and damnation, because God's plan, as you rightly put it, is manifest in Jesus. But, like, it's very dangerous territory, because a lot of this thinking comes from sort of our, our trying to philosophize the character of God and say, well, God wouldn't do this. That's very dangerous territory to, to, to say God wouldn't do something that he himself hasn't directly told you he would never. Um, because he did flood the entire planet and kill everyone except for Noah and his family. Was he unjustified in doing so? Was that cruel? It certainly feels cruel to us, right? And especially if, if we're only responsible for the active sins in our life, then it seems cruel because... Then it would be this. Well, everybody got the worst possible sentence imaginable, and that guy's worse than that guy, right? In, in terms of cosmic justice, there is no that guy's worse than that guy, right? That's when we talk about like that's why we don't have cardinal sins, right? Like in this life, me hitting you in the face is of a different degree than me murdering you, but in the eyes of God, it's the same. It's an affront to disobedience. It breaks that relationship now. Does that make sense? Yeah, that all makes sense. I completely agree with all of that. I guess it's, um, you know, rather than more to the question. Oh, well, what's that, the question? That's okay. So I'm just wondering, I was looking at, I think I was looking at people who are saying that it's a person who doesn't deserve it. And I guess it's a very common for the for God that did Joe actually deserve it? Did he say for it? The case that God did. But, but if he didn't yeah. deserve it, then God is unjustified in his action. Yeah. I think it's And at this point, we understand that it specifically comes from his mercy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That so and, and this is this is very difficult for especially modern Western thought, because modern Western thought is so steeped in the idea that we're sort of, in, there's some part of us that's inherently good. And so that means that, that some part of us is inherently deserving of good in return. Well, I, don't think that's true. well, I think a lot, I, I, I agree, but I think a lot of people and a lot of our thoughts are shaped by that idea. Right? Um, I did a, when I was in high school, there's an organization called Ongoing Ambassadors for Christ, and they they teach you how to kind of knock on doors and talk to people about faith and, and you know let them know about your church and things like that. And the number one response that we got to the question by by a long shot to do you think you're gonna go to heaven was yeah, well, yeah, I'm a pretty good person. Right? I'm a pretty good person. 
I haven't killed anybody. I haven't stolen my neighbor's stuff. I, I don't lie to people on a regular basis. You know, the list goes on and on, right? Um, but the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach, ah, I'm, a, I'm a good person. That's what I'm going to do. Right? The Bible teaches that you're going to heaven because Christ was a perfect person. And that he had to be that because you're not, and you can't, and you're not good. Because right? um, when I was a teenager, I really struggled with the, well, why do bad things happen to good people question. Right? And I, and I think if you're seriously thinking about morality, you should struggle with that question at some point. Right? And, and where I was really released from that struggle was uh, someone share with me what Martin Luther's response to that question was. And his, his response was, well, show me a good person. Right? Um, because if I'm just thinking in terms of like civic morality, then I could say, well, well my friend, he's a good guy. Right? Because in this world, he, you know, he's not murdering people. He doesn't bring his school's friends over and all that kind of stuff. Right? But in the eyes of God, his righteous deeds are like dirty rags, right? just like mine. Right? Um, and so Job is really forcing us to confront that reality of our being. Right? Um, Pete was waiting for impatient. Oh, yeah. Um, a couple of friends and I, we had been debating on the proto Evangelion, which is Genesis 3.15, where the first promise that someone was going to come to help once Adam and Eve were, 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 were in their sin. And I, I, I read this one Lutheran article, and it talked, what was the first thing Adam and Eve did when God appeared after they had sinned? They ran from God. They ran from God. That's our state. We can own all of our, our, our actions of running from God to sin. But the word for repent means to turn around. And that means we're going to turn our back to sin now and go to God. But we can't do that on our own. So in our state, without the Holy Spirit, Anything bad that happens to us is completely justified because our actual justification in our own sinful flesh is eternal death. But and we sort of have a natural inclination as to why do you think they ran away from God? Nobody told them about it, mm -hmm. but they knew that they were no longer the same, mm -hmm. that they were no longer worthy to be in communion in the presence of God. And I mean, think about when your parents catch you doing something that they know that you know that you shouldn't have been doing. It, right? Nobody has to tell you to feel bad about it. You just do. Right? Um, and so, and we would say that, you know, that's part of the law of God being written on the hearts of men. And it's part, I think it's a big part of the reason why Job doesn't curse God. Right? And there's even a part in here where he says, like, like who would accuse God? Because in accusing him, I'm afraid that I would incriminate myself. Like, I have, like, as much as I think I have a case, if I'm actually talking to God, I don't really have a case, right? He's going to, he's going to inform me that this isn't really the way things are, right? Um, okay, so let's go to the first question on the outline here. So what is Bildad's answer to Job's suffering? So Bildad is the first one who responds um, in uh, chapter 8, I believe. Yeah, and so his basic orientation is to, because the, the conundrum here is the suffering of Job. Why is this happening? How do we explain this? And um, and coming from the standpoint that God can't be in the wrong, right? So so how do we explain suffering? Does anybody kind of know what, what what's Bildad's answer? So Bildad um, says that God only serves the cure and upright. Right, so the, the suffering is proof of your wickedness, is what he says. Right? So if you are suffering, you must have done what? You must have done something wrong, right? And part of the reason Cooper is, is saying the things he's saying is, from what we've known of Job, he's not really doing those things, right? Now, we know that he's, he's a fallen, sinful creature, but he's also blameless. He's a man of integrity, and, he, and he's faithful in the eyes of God, right? So, so Bildad's answer is, well, that must not be true, because if you're suffering, it's because you've done something to deserve it, right? In other words, he's trying to, all these guys in different ways are trying to explain away the problem of Job's suffering. And in, in, in every case, 
just in a different way, who's the one to blame? Job, Job himself, right? And and Job's response is like, I, you know, I can't think of anything. Um, and in verse in chapter nine, verse two, when he replies to Bildad the first time, he says, "But how can a man be in the right before God?" Right. And so he says, in other words, like. I think I'm in the right, but how can I be in the right before God if God has seen fit to do this, right? And that's expressed in the famous phrase that he says that, that the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Um, and that's really a good kind of key verse for the whole book. As you guys will see. All right, so that was Bildad's answer to Joseph. Seemed like he was a nice one. Bildad? Yeah. <laughs> They, so, and they, if you've ever been in a kind of discussion like this, where you're trying to convince somebody of something they, they don't want to be convinced of, you usually start out compassionate, but you're going to number. So, each one, so, uh, by, there's a certain point where Joe basically says, oh, what great friends you are, <laughs> what great comforters you are in my Um And so, that's not, not really the thing. Uh, number two, uh, Zophar's answer. What is Zophar's answer to Joseph? He says he's a liar. He says he's a liar, right? Yeah, and he's basically accusing him of lying about the same thing, right? So Zophar is in the, in the belief that we're in control of our own suffering. Because if we do something that, that causes God to be upset, then that creates our own suffering. So he says, if we live rightly god will bless us is that an old idea that's no longer no longer taught today or is that still something taught today it, yeah <laughs> what, what do we typically call that health and wealth or the, the the old classical term is prosperity gospel right the the joe holsteins you'll have your best life now um so if you if you're doing the stuff of the christian life correctly You'll get that job you want. You'll marry that person you want to marry. You'll have you'll be blessed with kids, and all these things, right? And so, if that's the argument you're making, and you're confronting Job, who's now sitting in ashes, scraping wounds, open sores with pieces of pottery, and all of his children are dead. What does that mean that Job Job didn't do? He didn't live rightly, and that's why he is where he is, right? So now you can see why he says, "Oh, thank you for your comfort." Pete. That's a real quick. Um, in Job's reply to, 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 to build that um, at chapter or verse 33, I, I, I love this that, that Job says because there is no arbiter between us, meaning him and God, who might lay his hand on us both. Let him take his rod away from me, and let not dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak without fear of him, for I am not so myself. And I'm thinking, if only he had known that there would be. <laughs> well, and now for the rest of the story, right? We'll get there. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Out. Yeah, so there's there's no arbitrary between us. Uh, but then we'll, in, in, in uh, chapter 19, he says something different. Um, what is Job's response to the prosperity gospel so far? He says that um, his friends know it all. They're, they're better than he is. Oh, yeah, and he, is he being uh, truthful or sarcastic? sarcastic? Oh, he's being very sarcastic. Right? Oh, you have all the answers. If only, if only I talked to you before, right? Um, and so Job's conclusion is very good. It's the opposite of Zophar's, that human suffering is not within our control. It's firmly in the control of who? God. Right? So it's beyond our control. It is the province of God. Uh, and... Not only that, but even goes as far to say it has, and it has nothing to do with our own effort or goodness. Okay. So, for example, how many of you have known a wonderful person, kind, blameless, in the same sense that we're talking about Job here, and they were diagnosed with cancer, or they died too young, or they were part of an accident, or 
you know, right? And so this is what Joe was talking about. Is these sort of things, they're not in our control. They're not direct consequences for our choices, which is another demonstration of the place we occupy in our relationship with God. Like we're at his person. Right? Is that wrong? So in a certain sense, you can say that. You can say it in, in the same sort of general sense we're saying about the Job, right? That that suffering in this life is is at the hands of Satan and sin, right? So the 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 other holy trinity is is the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh, right? All of the suffering in our in our world comes from those three things. Right? It is uh, it's uh, good. the only one that going to Um. So in this fashion, that's all. I mean, he doesn't he doesn't do he doesn't turn this, us over to the same sort of thing. Uh, it's more of a understanding that until Christ returns, there is this this battle going on. Now he's given us everything we need to fight the battle. Right? You have the the armor, you know, that's described in the sword of truth and all that, right? The armor of God that we're given in Christ, but. Um, like we don't say specific things. Like we can't say, well, Hurricane Katrina was because New Orleans is a debauchery with New Orleans place or something. Um, and that kind of goes with the territory of understanding that like God provides rain for the just and the unjust. Right? It's not a he, he does not operate punitively in the world in that sense. At least not anymore. Right. Um, but that is going to be the nature of the return of God. Like those in Christ, it will be a day of great joy. And those not in Christ, it will be of weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so what Job is highlighting is the aspect of God that, that sort of we try to not focus on or ignore because it does make us uncomfortable. Right? I don't like the idea that I'm not in control of I don't like the idea that I can't control really whether or not I get sick. That I can't control whether or not people I care about die when they're younger or when they're older. Right? And really, you can think of all of the angst of the human race is really railing against that idea. And all of our attempts for knowing things and learning things and growing is to exercise more and more control over our world. Because the more we can do that, the less we have to deal with the unknown. And Job is about the reality that those there are things that are never going to be in your control. And so Job's friends are well, his friends, but they're all trying to explain that away. They're trying to take something that's out of our control and put it in our control in some form or fashion. Right? Uh, and Zophar is saying, you know, if you do what you're supposed to, he blesses you. And if you don't, he punishes you. So you must have done something you weren't supposed to. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That was the sickest I've ever been. And I think I realized sickness is our protection. I have known before I saw my wife alive, had some sense of having on our short He was able to do. Given to God, allow him to do it, but he, that's what he is. That was somebody who was going to do it. And for whatever reason, for a time, God allowed him. Well, yeah, so we would say that he does allow it because he's in control over yeah. Satan. He could stop any moment. But we would say that the reason he allows it is for mercy. Right. So the reason he allows it is as soon as, as Christ returns. 
I got to know God so well at that point. It was it was a great lesson in the sense that I I thought about Job's suffering, thought about his wife's suffering, and I knew mine was the same. We don't know how long he sat there in the attic enjoying this great constant, uh, yeah. constant misery. Yeah. Whereas I had breaks when he would come back and then it would go away. I just thought, this it's been in my head. Are you going to choose God? And I think that's one reason we have to get this. Would I choose for Job to believe that God would be? That's the Holy Spirit. But I'm saying, I mean, God didn't cause him to do so. I guess he must have been trying to get him to do so. And this was a small thing compared to some of the things. Sure. Well, it, so it's, it's kind of it's tricky. It's so amazing how he started um, handling. Yeah, so you're actually you're actually talking about some things we're going to talk about when we get to the sixth petition. So we'll we'll come back to what you're saying because it's right on that that like God does actually give trials to the faithful, right? He does this numerous times in the scriptures, just in order to strengthen their faith, right? And so um, you know we can't say. Unless you're a person in the midst of that trial, you can't say with any certainty which which it is, whether it's just a suffering or whether it's a trial of faith. And in some sense, you could say all forms of suffering for someone of faith is a trial. Uh, and really what Job is doing, the book of Job is doing, is helping us put the understanding of our suffering in proper context. Right? Because if it if we don't understand our the, the context of our own suffering, we're tempted to think way the devil wants us to that god doesn't love us that we're unworthy and what's the point right and that's that's what nihilism is nihilism is the idea that there is no purpose no point. and often people who end up in that place experience a lot of pain and suffering before they get there and that's what leads them to it right um and so the what we say is that the, the reason that god allows for the state of things as they are right now is out of mercy because when he does return the axe is at the root of the trees and the time for the mercy of christ is over so there's no more chances right and so the fact that he extends this time of the time of the church we would say where we've been sent out to bring this message of of the gospel in the midst of a suffering world is actually at the mercy of god because when he returns, there's no more conversion. There's no more second chances and stuff. Sure. Is it also for the people who might be sick of it, right? Is it also for us to say? Yeah, yeah. So um, it is also, it, it's not just, especially if it's somebody within a Christian community, it is, their suffering isn't just for them. But they're bearing in the midst of that suffering is a witness to you, as well as a, a prompting for you to do the things that you're called to do, like pray for them, bear their burdens with them. Yeah. Yeah, in the gospel where they climb in on the work right away, everybody said that sin is when God and Jesus said, No, that this is for the glory of God, this particular right. to heal them. Right. Yeah. Very good. Okay, so. Um, got to keep going. All right, question number three. Who is Job appealing to in chapter 19, verses 25 to 27? So he says here, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not my heart thinks within me. So 
who is he appealing to? There? He's appealing to God. And who is he appealing to God for? Huh? Well, that's who he's appealing to. What is he? What is he asking of the person he's appealing to? His great mercy. Yeah. Right. So, in Old Testament language, before because Job doesn't know Jesus, he's appealing to God against God. Right. He's appealing to God to intercede on behalf of Him in the presence of God. Right. So we get a little Trinitarian image here. Where he's saying, I know that my Redeemer lives. And he's already established in his answers to his friends and the way that he's said things that who is the only person that can confront God? God. Who's the only person that can control suffering? God, right? So when he's saying, I know that my Redeemer lives, he moved from there's no arbiter between us to I know that my Redeemer lives. And the only person who can intercede and make any difference in the situation is God. Right? Yeah. 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 Because even like when you initially read Job, I think sometimes you're thinking, well, it kind of sounds like you doubt God. Because there's a couple of times when he's talking where you're like, it seems like he is trying to make a case against the punishment that God is giving him, right? But in the midst of all that questioning, he's always acknowledging that, like, in a sort of sense, I don't want to get an answer to my questions because if I do, it's not going to go well for me, right? God, who, who can be blameless in the presence of God? Right? Um, and so here he's appealing to God against himself, right? He wants God to intercede between God and him, right? Uh, so this is establishing that the Redeemer cannot be a human person. Right? Not just a human person. Because a human person can't do anything about your suffering, ultimately speaking. Right? They can alleviate some things here and there, but they can't really prevent the suffering that, that is in this life. Right? When reading this, I'm, I'm parallel with David in the Psalms, how many times he uses the word to walk and redeemer. Right. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's beautiful. So, so, so far, then, what is the context of the suffering of Job? That we've we've come across in the first four chapters. So Job is a Job is a blameless man. He's he's a man of integrity, a man of faith, right? So he's he's that means he's faithful in his worship of God. Does not mean he's sinless, right? And then the devil comes along and says, the only reason this guy believes in you is because you gave him all this stuff. And God says, No, but have at it. Right? And then he takes all that stuff away. And then Job is sitting in the ashes and his friends come. And they're trying to explain away the suffering. You must have done something. Um, and we'll get to uh, the last guy. Uh, he gets kind of the closest to the correct answer. But, not quite. but notice that all of Job's responses to his friends, his friends, his friends answers are all very focused on the human side of this equation. And Job's responses are always pertaining to God. Right? Who can act without his permission? Right? What, is, what is outside of his control? And he's basically making a case for, like, no, I mean, God is in control of everything. Right? Um, and so he's appealing to both the sovereignty of God in terms of justice, but now in chapter 19, also in terms of mercy. So he's basically acknowledging that, that my suffering can only be solved if God chooses to solve it. And so he appeals to God to be that I know that my Redeemer is, right? Essentially, he's making the same, I think, if I understood what Cooper was saying, is he's saying, from what I know of God, I have reason to hope in him. I don't have reason to hope in me, right, which is what all of his friends are trying to convince him. That, oh, you just need to repent of this thing, or you just need to do this instead of that. Right? But he's, his appeal is to hope in God because he knows that God is a God of mercy as well as God is just. Right? Uh, and so God is the key for Job in both those aspects. He's, he is the answer to the suffering, right? He's in control of all things, but he's also the answer to the relief. I think, to that testament, God's control of all things. I think a lot of people look at 
sin and God in the same way that Star Wars does. That it's a, a fight between good and evil. Like, no, it, it's not. God allows the devil to reign here temporarily. I mean, he's given the devil some permission. Um, he's in authority over him. The devil had to come to God to do this. Yeah. Um, God is sovereign in control over all things. And, and I think we forget that that means all things. Right. And so that, and that really is the central like, the key, I think, to understanding Job. And it's, it's a sort of epitomizing the famous phrase, right? The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. That, if anything, is a statement of the absolute sovereignty of God. And so what Job is about so far that we're reading is acknowledging the reality of what that really means. Um, and then when you pair that with Christ, all of a sudden the grace of God is that much more amazing. Right? Because I'm totally helpless. Job is totally helpless. He couldn't do a thing about any of the stuff that was happening. So. And he knew that. Right? His friends were trying to tell him, no, you do have something to do with it. Right? This is punishment because you did this thing. Or you didn't do this thing. So if, only, if you only did that, then this would all go away. And he's saying, no, God, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. And he's justified in doing it. Exactly. We, have to, we have to keep going. We're, we've already spent way too long on this. Um, okay, uh, sixth petition. Uh, and lead us not into temptation. So uh, if you want to open up your catechisms to the sixth petition in the back, it is on page 269. And lead us not into temptation. And we'll read the what does this mean together. What does this mean? God tempts no one. We pray, pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. Although we are attacked by these things, we pray that we may finally overcome them and win the victory. Okay. Uh, lead us not into temptation. So let's look at a couple of Bible passages that pertain to temptation. Um, can somebody look up James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4? Brian, that's that one. Okay, and then somebody else look up James 1, 12 to 15. Bob, got that one? James 1, 12 to 15. And then Genesis 3, 1 through 7. Yeah, I know where that is. It's got <laughs> Genesis 3. Russ, can you get Matthew 4? All right, now we're going to read a couple of passages. So I'm going to have I'm going to have those people read their two passages. We're going to compare what they say. Okay. All right, I run into one. Start with James. Um, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because we know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Um, perseverance must finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. We did a whole study on this. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Nice. I like that. All right. So, and then uh, the James 1 12 and 16. Blessed is the man who perseveres in the trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempted me, for God cannot be tempted to buy evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after the desire is conceived, he gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's a few weird things, a few like weird Christian statements. Count your sufferings as joy. Which I, I'm, I'm always like struck by those passages when I read them and I was reading it this week because like we've become so comfortable that when we encounter suffering, particularly the suffering for the faith, we do not count it as joy. Even collectively as the church we do. Right? Um, like 
just all of the lamentation about the state of America and how it's going away from being a Christian country and all this stuff flies in the face of, of this statement. That was like, because we have all of these opportunities, the way that this is encouraging us to think about it is, oh goodness, I have so many opportunities now to bear witness to Jesus through myself if he calls me to do that. So if he calls me to be at odds with my school teacher about about the way my kid spends their time, or if he calls me to be at odds with the coach or uh, my neighbor or whatever, right? Instead of that being a bad thing, and I've done this with family ministry sometimes too, I encourage them, think about how great a witness you're being to Christ if you tell your coach or your teacher, I'm sorry, you know, we're not going to be here for this. We have church. They made a movie about a guy who did that in the Olympics. There's a reason they made a movie about it. It wasn't like he was the best runner there ever was, right? So those are, the, that's sort of what this is saying. It's count your suffering as joy. Cool. Um, in particular, when it's talking about joyous suffering, referring to suffering for Christ, the witness of the gospel in particular, right? Now, there are many places in the world where that's all they get to do. That their suffering is the witness they bear. Right? Because they're not allowed to worship God. Um, Pastor, yeah, I guess you could say God well, doesn't tempt anyone. Just go back to Job, where God could have told Satan, "Okay, I'll tempt him, I'll just stop him, we'll see." Right. Yeah. So he's he's not right, and, and uh, that's the first thing that's in the what does this mean, right? Luther says, "God tempts no one." So what we're saying here is, when you're asking God to lead us not into temptation, you're not accusing Him of leading you into temptation, but you're asking. For his protection from that. Right? And then at the end of James uh, chapter 1, 12 to 15 gives you kind of a, a short description of the way temptation, desire, and sin work. Right? That it's your own warped desire that creates the temptation. And then when that becomes fully grown, it manifests in sin. And then when sin becomes fully grown, it manifests in death. Um, so highlighting the fact that. Those don't come from God, they're coming from within. Okay. And this is mentioned too in the Beatitudes and stuff as well, right? Where Jesus says, Blessed are those who suffer for my name's sake. Uh, and so, Christians, that is, there's a lot of books that are being written right now actually by historians who are going back and trying to figure out as our Western culture is kind of crumbling a bit, they're trying to go back and look at. What is really the root? And you can't do that without tracing the history of the Christian church. Right? And one of the things that they're finding is the main reason the Christian church grew and became the way it did was because of this sort of approach to life. Is that when everybody else is fleeing the, the catastrophe, the Christians are walking into it. And, and whenever everybody else is valuing their own lives over others, the Christians are valuing others' lives over them. And it really is a, I think that is mainly what it's meant by Christ when he says those who, who want to keep their life will lose it, but those who lose their life they will find it. Right? He's, he's, he's talking about this idea that, like, and I think it's rooted in the knowledge that you're good. Like, not good in a moral sense, but like you're taken care of. You know, in Christ, you no longer have any ultimate worry about yourself and your being. And so you can approach these things in this way. You can view suffering as joy because you know it's temporary. You can view death as a sad thing, but not an ultimately sad thing because we know life is our choice. That's the only way humans like us can do things like that, walking into catastrophes and valuing others' lives over our own. Right. So, that's all right. Why, that's why Christianity is thriving in third world countries. You can really have a high effect. Don't worship it. But in first world countries, Christianity dying or dead. That's fine. Well, it's not dead. No, it won't fall. <laughs> uh, you can't say that to my cousin this week. It's, it's dead up there. It, yeah, it's not. It, I, I would I would say you could say it's dying in Europe because I've, I've been there, but it's not dead. There are there. I mean, there are just we just had uh, the the bishop in Finland and the politician in Latvia. Go on trial basically for confessing the word of God. Right? 
they actually read scripture out in the court case as hate speech. Right? And so like, there are there are faithful Christians there. They're under a lot of pressure because they're vastly outnumbered, but uh, they're there. All right, Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves pulling clothes. All right. All right, so keep that one in mind, and we're going to read the Matthew 4, 1 to 11. And Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after the night, he was 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the devil took him to the city and sent him on the hill called Peter and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, You will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you destroy your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you fall down and and Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. The devil left him, and the Lord angels came and come with Jesus. All right. So, why do you think we chose those two to compare? What, what happened in each one? Temptation, right, from the devil. The first one, we've got first Adam and Eve. And what happens there? They succumb, they succumb to the temptation, right? That's the fall into sin. And then uh, Jesus, who's also described as the second Adam, undergoes the same temptation from the devil. The devil comes to tempt him. And this is at the beginning of his, his earthly ministry. So the devil's trying to derail God's plan here in Jesus. And how does he fare? He overcomes, he overcomes the temptation, right? So that is the, like, the reason that you are made right before God is that Jesus overcame the temptation, not you. That's part of that, that, that nature of his atonement, right? That's why we say we put on his robe of righteousness. It's not our own, right? He's covered us in his robe of righteousness, in his perfection, in his ability to resist temptation to sin. Um, and I think it's important to point out that there's a reason it's first Adam and second Adam, because a lot of times people want to even jokingly blame Eve. But what does the scripture say right there about Adam? It specifically includes a clause that says, and Adam, who was with her? And according to the way that God gave Eve to Adam and Adam to Eve, was Adam responsible for Eve's well-being? So it wasn't like Adam was over there and she got snookered by the devil and then she brought the fruit to him. He was standing right next to her and listened to the whole thing. He did nothing. And then he got another opportunity from God to do something because you don't think God knew the answer to, you know, why are you hiding from me? He's giving Adam another opportunity to do what he's supposed to do. And what does he do? He throws his wife under the bus. The woman, and he blames God too. He says, woman, you gave to me. <laughs> right? Um, and then Jesus, of course, where all the places that we fail, Jesus succeeds. Right? So that's that comparison. All right. Uh, plus, last couple of thoughts on the back end here. What is the most basic temptation to what 
does it lead and to what does it lead indicated by Luther's explanation? And Genesis 1 kind of gives you an idea about this as well, as well as the Matthew 4. To think yourself God, right? And so I would say that of the, the way I, I wrote this was that, that false belief is, is the, the sort of main attacking point. Because if he can get you to believe in something other than God, he can convince you of lots of other things. Um, and so in the, in the Garden of Eden, the appeal is he even uses God, but he says, well, what God really wants is for you to be able to be like him. So he dangles like, oh, you can be like that. Um, and that's that's the, the, the thing there. Is not, um, isn't, is not that why what Lucifer also had was that he put himself on equal footing with God, that he could be just like him and was just as wonderful and, and, and powerful as him? Yeah, but I would argue that before pride comes disbelief. Okay. Because yeah. in order to believe that you can be like God, you have to have some sort of, in order for that to even take root, you have to have some sort of dissatisfaction mm -hmm. with the current state of things. Gotcha. Right. Um, and so what the devil did is he created a picture that sowed dissatisfaction with the state of things in the garden. Right? That your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. Um, and what does that lead to? And look at the words of, of Luther's explanation. It gives you a list there. How does he end the list? And the what does this mean part? Other great shame and vice, right? So false belief and like, so moving your belief from God to something else, whether it's you or some other thing, it leads to all of those other sins. That's sort of the first step down the path toward all that other great change by deception, uh, misleading, despair, etc. And why does that happen? Because it turns out we can't be God. It turns out something besides God can't be God. So when, when that happens, when you try to replace God with something that's not God, whether it's money or you or reputation or whatever it is, it doesn't work, and so then the rest sort of falls. What promise does God make regarding temptation? So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure. Okay, so how do we make sense of that with what we just read before? God will never tempt you beyond your ability, but it seems like Adam and Eve got tempted beyond their ability. It seems like I get tempted beyond my ability and I go to the temptation. He provided them in the way. Yeah. <laughs> in what way? They could have walked away from the serpent. They could have said no. They could have called on God. Oh, I see, I see what you're saying. Um, I don't. I don't think that's the escape that he provides for us. Well, the escape is the long run, right? Like the, 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 the prophecy about the serpent's head being crushed mm -hmm. and the right. redemption. Yeah. yeah. Right. And the same for us, right? Because, like, I think I just wanted to address that because I think sometimes we read that and we think, well, then why am I succumbing to temptation? That's not going to tend to be on my ability. I think sometimes we think that means that. Anytime they do succumb, succumb to temptation, they're somehow like chipping away at their faith. Um, I've, I've also looked at this verse uh, as not every fight is yours. Um, and sometimes you 
You know how we say we can we can plant the seeds, but we can't actually bring somebody to Christ. Yeah. God's in control, and, and, and we we have to be mindful of where He's calling us. And sometimes He's not calling us into the fire of a temptation. Sometimes He's asking us go that way. Oh, yeah, I see. What you're saying. Yeah. Well, this is this is more talking about in the midst of a temptation. Um, that you're provided a way out. The way out isn't like use your brain, use your legs. Because what we just compared in reading Genesis 3 and Matthew 4 is our attempt at that versus God's attempt at that. And one didn't work. Our attempt didn't work. And it never does. There's numerous examples in the scriptures of even the great people in the scriptures succumbing to temptation. Um, and so the way out, as Cooper is the long run, right, is the, like, what do you do then when you succumb to temptation now that you are in Christ? You come, you come to God, the prompting of the Holy Spirit, you turn, you know, confess your sins and ask for forgiveness, and what do you receive? Forgiveness. Forgiveness because in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus did not succumb to temptation. Yeah. But it's, it's also meant to be a word of hope, right? I mean, Yes, it's almost, I, I, I kind of read it as the plan A, plan B, and it's like, well, we do have the Holy Spirit, right, that does empower us to, what do you say, overcome the oh, yeah, yeah. but then, of course, in our weakness, we fail, uh, but I don't know, it's, I would say it's all part of plan A, it's not really plan A and plan B, but you're right in highlighting an aspect, but I was mainly trying to address the fact that if you give in to temptation, that it, what, it doesn't mean that like you closed all your exit routes that God provided you because his exit route accounts for the knowledge that like Adam and Eve, you're going to give in to temptation. Uh, but now you're right. It, it, now as the new man, the new Adam, the new spirit of God that lives within us, we have been given the ability to resist those. And sometimes we do, right? The other, the other this really is a word book. But the other aspect of it too is what's one of the things you're tempted to think when you're struggling with something? That you're alone. You're the only weird person that struggles with this. Everybody else has no, no issues, right? And, and just think how easy it is to do that, right? Whether it's you come to church and you're all frazzled and there's another family next to you, another couple next to you, and they look all put together. So we got here. My house is a total disaster, and I'm the only person living this way. Everybody else has got put together. Right? And the only way to break you of that notion is to actually get to know the people and realize their lives are also messes in a lot of similar ways, right? Uh, and so part of the part of the comfort here is that like what you're experiencing is not something that is unique to you uh, because the devil uses that and your own simple flesh uses that to try and isolate you from people who can, who can alleviate you of that delusion. So you may be like, yeah, you, like it could be as simple as a conversation in church. You're like, oh my gosh, you guys, you're just so put together. Your kids are always behaving, and they might be like. I just shouted at my son for 15 <laughs> minutes an hour. <laughs> and then you're going to be like, oh my goodness, thank God I'm not the only one. Right? So th that, that is, that's, that's part of it. Yeah. Either you succumb to temptation, whatever it is, that's for forgiveness. Don't be conscious. Yeah. Lo and behold, a week later, a month later, you do something else stupid. And then you wonder, how many chances do I get? 70 times so. I'm asking, I'm how many chances do you get? I'm asking for a friend. Yeah, no, I said, honestly, like, I thought it was really funny when I was preparing the job section. I thought it actually met well with the sixth petition and the temptation because it still is dealing with that, that aspect of. Suffering and when you're, when you're led into temptation, you succumb to it, you're suffering. And I think that context really helps, right? Because that context doesn't, it's not there just to show you the depth of your own depravity. It's also there to show you the unbelievable depth of God's mercy. Right? And that, so you can't fully understand the depth of the grace of God in Jesus until you know fully the problem he came to solve. The depth of the issue that we were in, right? and so with, if that's the case, then you do really understand that if this is going to work at all, 
there's got to be no limit to the chances, right? It has to be an unconditional thing. That's why we disagree with the Catholics on, on synergistic grace. Because as soon as it becomes any part of my responsibility, I can no longer put absolute hope in that grace. Because if I read the scriptures, we don't do so hot. Right? Um, and so that this this context of the suffering at times can be really tempting to just really hammer away at the law and really be like, you know, we're all scum. And believe it or not, people like to get beat up by the law. They like to be told things that they know. Especially because they know there's a little bit of truth to it. Sometimes a lot, right? But that context in Job is not just to get you there, but from there to where Job is, right? He starts out by saying, there's no arbiter between us. There's nobody that can do anything. But then he appeals to God on behalf of himself in the presence of God. He says, well, you're the only one who can do something about this. So, and I know you will because you're you. So I know that my Redeemer lives, and I will see him at the end, right? And so that, that's sort of the full context. The initial context you receive is, like, you have to deal with the reality of your own depravity, what that means in the presence of God. But then once you're there, you understand when Christ comes into the picture, the reality of what he means for you. And then you understand that there is no condition. There can't be. Otherwise, we're, we're, we are we do not have But we do. Because there is no condition. Which is great. Right. Any last thoughts, questions, or close? Okay. If you feel unsatisfied by my explanations about joke, See me after. I just didn't want to spend a ton of time on that since that's not the advertised Bible study. I know. I know. I, part of it was my fault because I forgot to put questions on it last week or so. So, um, but I, as always, I'm blessed by your insights. And Shall we read 21 to 30? Yeah. Or so now we're going to for, for, yeah, we won't have class next week because we have a congregational meeting. So for two weeks from now, we're going to read 21 to 30. That's only five so get, chapters a week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> Crucify <laughs> that simple flesh. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are at your mercy. We know that we deserve nothing good. That because of our actions and our nature that has been fallen into sin, we deserve your temporal and eternal we're so grateful for your mercy and grace that you sent your son Jesus to become flesh so that he could do what we could not, so that we could know the depth of your grace that solves the problem of our suffering as only you can. Help us to be firm and secure in that hope, the hope of the promise of your word, not in our own action, in our own thoughts or deeds, but in what you have done in Jesus. And help us to carry that hope, that word, with us wherever we go, to bear witness to you, so that more and more people may know the depth of your grace and mercy, the beautiful promises of life everlasting in Jesus. Is there any prayer? Amen. Amen. Amen.